In this video, we'll learn about the matrix inverse and how it applies to numerical methods problems. This video contains two parts. In the first part, we'll discuss some theory behind the matrix inverse. In the second part, we'll tie it all together using a quick example. There's a whole lot of pure math you can learn about involving the matrix inverse, but because this is an application course, I stripped out most of the abstract linear algebra theory stuff and only have what I consider to be the bare essentials. Without further ado, let's get into it. Just to review, we can express a series of m simultaneous linear equations with n unknowns in matrix form. Keep in mind that m and n don't necessarily have to be equal, but they must be equal if you want to solve the problem via matrix inversion because invertible matrices must be square. A, X, and B all have physical interpretations. The B vector represents external stimuli acting on the system, like a force or a heat flux. The A matrix represents the system's parameters. It contains parameters which dictate how the external stimuli and the responses are coupled. And finally, X is the vector of responses. Also as a review, the matrix Z is called the inverse of A if you get the identity matrix I upon multiplying A and Z. A is not always invertible even if A is square. The invertible matrix theorem contains a whole list of conditions you can check to determine if A is invertible or not, but the three I like to use and are probably the fastest to check are listed here. To make things easier on ourselves, let's just assume that any A matrix in the rest of this presentation is invertible. Hopefully the last two slides were a review. Here's where we introduce some new stuff. Linear systems exhibit two useful properties you can leverage, superposition and proportionality. Superposition states that the total response of a variable equals the summation of that variable's response to all the individual inputs. This is the mathematical definition of superposition. It can be kind of hard to interpret, so here's an analogy I like to use. Let's say you're sitting in your room on a hot summer day. You want to cool down, so you turn on two fans. If you assume the room's temperature is linearly related to the power of the fans, you can compute the total drop in the room's temperature by combining the temperature drop caused by only one fan and the temperature drop caused only by the other fan. This is really useful when it comes to understanding how individual forcing functions affect a particular response variable. You can solve the system for one forcing function and set the other forcing functions to zero, compute the response, then solve the system for another forcing function while setting the others to zero, compute the response, and so forth until the end. Then you add up all the individual responses and you get the total response. Proportionality is a pretty cool concept. It states that if you evaluate a linear function at the value alpha times b, where alpha is a scalar, you get the same result if you evaluate the function at b and then multiply it by alpha. The advantage is if I evaluate f of b, and then I say I want to have some b that's say twice the value, I don't have to evaluate the function again. I can just take my response f of b and multiply it by 2. When it comes to linear systems of equations, if the entire b vector is scaled by some amount, the x vector will change by that amount as well, so you don't need to resolve the system. By the way, these two are not random properties. They come from the rules of scalar multiplication, commutation, and whatnot. Rewatch the matrix terminology review video and see if you can prove to yourself why these properties exist. Here are examples of superposition and proportionality to make things more concrete. Let's say our function is f of b equals 2b, which is obviously a linear function. Suppose we want to find the sum of f of 3 plus f of 5. We could evaluate the function twice and sum the results, and we get 16. But instead of evaluating both f of 3 and f of 5, Superposition allows us to evaluate f of 3 plus 5, and we'll get the same answer. Exploiting superposition allowed us to only have to evaluate f of b once, not twice. Keep in mind that this applies only to linear systems. If we try doing the same thing for a nonlinear equation like sine of b, we won't get matching answers. Here's an example of proportionality. Now let's say we don't actually know what the function f of b is, but we do know that f of 5 equals 10, and there's a scaling factor, alpha equals 2. If the problem wants us to find the value of f of 5 alpha, we can't plug in 5 times alpha into the equation because we don't know what the equation is. But proportionality tells us that f of 5 alpha equals alpha times f of 5, and we know f of 5, so we can solve the problem in that way. Once again, this won't work for nonlinear systems. 
If you evaluate sine at alpha times pi over 4, you'll get a different answer than if you evaluate sine of pi over 4, then multiply it by alpha. Now let's actually move on to the concept of the matrix inverse. We'll denote each element of the matrix inverse with a negative 1 exponent. Keep in mind that this does not mean the reciprocal of that element. Generally speaking, to find x, we multiply a inverse by b. We know that a inverse is given by this matrix, so if we expand out the matrices, we can write individual equations for each x as a linear combination of each b. Once again, keep in mind that m and n are equal since the a and a inverse matrices must be square. The implications of this are tremendous. Because each response variable is a linear combination of each forcing function, the individual elements of the A inverse matrix are actually proportionality constants which represent the response due to a unit stimulus. Mathematically, Aij inverse represents the change in the ith response variable due to a unit change in the jth forcing function. In other words, the total value of the response variable is the superposition of the responses to all the individual forcing functions applied one at a time. Note that AM1 inverse is independent of the effects of B2 and B3 on X1, which are reflected in the coefficients AM2 inverse and AM3 inverse, respectively. We can take this a step further and throw proportionality into the mix. Suppose we want to know how the total response changes if all the elements in the B vector change not just by a unit amount. Proportionality makes this really easy. Instead of having to resolve the system, we just multiply each B value by the amount it changed and superpose them. For example, let's say there are three elements in the B vector. Element 1 is scaled by alpha, element 2 is scaled by beta, and element 3 is scaled by gamma. If we want to know how the third response variable, x3, is affected by these changes to the B vector, all we do is take this equation, but change the Bs to the B times the respective scale factor and add them. So far, we've discussed what the matrix inverse is and why it's important, but we never actually learned how to compute it. For a 2x2 two two matrix, the formula is simple and you've most likely seen it before. If you have a 2x2 two two system on a test or something, it would be fair game to ask you to compute the inverse by hand. But if A is 3x3 three three or larger, the math can get too tedious to do manually, so you can just throw it into the INV function in MATLAB. There's been a lot of concepts in this video so far, so let's do a quick example. Suppose we have three bungee jumpers of various masses. Each jumper is connected by a bungee cable of various elasticities, which we represent by a spring constant, k. After they jump, they come to rest at some position below their equilibrium position. You can draw a free body diagram of each jumper, but I'll spare you the math and you eventually end up with this system of equations. You can type x equals a backslash b in MATLAB to find the three values, but let's hold off on actually doing that for now. Instead, let's look specifically at the A matrix, or rather, the inverse of the A matrix. We know that each element of the A inverse matrix quantifies how changing one jumper's force affects another jumper's displacement. When we compute A inverse in MATLAB using the given k values, we end up with these values. Observe that the numbers in the first column indicate that the position of all three jumpers would increase by 0.02 meters if we added an extra newton of force to the top jumper. This makes sense because the additional force would stretch the first cord by that amount, and then the other two jumpers below him would just be dragged along down with the first jumper. In contrast, the numbers in the second column indicate that applying an additional 1 newton force to the second jumper would move the first jumper down by 0.02 meters, but the second and third jumpers by 0.03 meters. The 0.02 meter elongation of the first jumper makes sense because the first cord is subject to an extra 1 newton regardless of whether the force is applied to the first or the second jumper. However, for the second jumper, the elongation is now 0.03 meters because along with the first cord, the second cord also elongates due to the additional force. And of course, the third jumper displaces just as much as the second jumper because there's no additional force on the third cord that connects them. Finally, let's look at the third column. The numbers indicate that applying an additional 1 newton force to the third jumper results in the first and second jumpers moving the same distances as when the force was applied to the second jumper. But now, because of the additional elongation of the third cord, the third jumper is moved farther downwards. I hope these explanations helped you link the physical interpretations to the numerical output you get from MATLAB. You should especially pay very close attention to when an entry in the A inverse matrix is zero.
Now let's put the bungee jumpers on the moon. The moon's gravity is only about one-sixth of Earth's gravity. We know that the gravity influences the b-vector, so what we're essentially doing is asking how the displacements change when we scale the b-vector. This is where proportionality is really handy. We can solve the systems to find the displacements on Earth, as I did up here. We can then apply proportionality and cut the x-vector in 6 to find their displacements on the moon because we cut the gravity term by 6. That's it. There's no need to redefine any parameters and resolve the system like I did down here, although you're welcome to if you want. Here's a completely different scenario. We're back on Earth, so for now you can disregard everything we did in the last slide. This is a standalone unrelated example. We can easily solve the system of equations by issuing either x equals a backslash b or x equals inverse of a times b. But now we're interested in knowing how the deflections change if we apply more force to each jumper. Now we have to combine superposition and proportionality. Let's just look at jumper 3 for now. We can apply this formula and plug in the delta b's, or in this case the delta f's, and we can see that the third jumper will displace by an extra 2.7 meters. If we want to compute the additional deflection of each jumper, we can simply multiply a inverse by the vector containing the additional forces. This will tell us how much extra distance each jumper will fall, so the total displacement is just the original displacement plus this vector of extra displacements. To summarize, the matrix inverse tells us a lot of information. Each element of the matrix inverse represents the change in one of the responses due to a unit change in one of the forcing functions. We can apply superposition and proportionality to help us understand the effects of changing the forcing functions without actually needing to resolve the system. Finally, the inverse of a 2x2 matrix can be computed by hand, whereas the inverse of larger matrices can be calculated using tools like MATLAB. See you next time.